chapter 5. Chapter 5 is the integumentary system, which is fancy for hair, skin, and nails, um, and glands as well. So pretty much everything that we're going to talk about here is what type of tissue? Epithelial tissue. So you're going to see that common denominator in a lot of these uh, structures here. So we uh, normally have a model. I'm going to go to the model first, and then I'll come back. Here is a cross-section of skin. And this is obviously not to scale. People think, hey, my skin's really that thick. It's not this thick. This right here is what you and I call our actual skin. That's our epidermis. And you can see these little ridges. We all have those, and those are unique to each of us. They're what make our fingerprints and our different lines. And we're going to talk about those as we get a little bit further. But this is technically called our epidermis. Below that is what we'll end up calling our dermis. And then underneath here, what is this yellow tissue? Fat. It's adipose. This is our hypodermis. So when you hear the term like hypodermic, that means it's going through those two layers and making it all the way here. Some patterns that you see when you're looking at this type of model is that the blood vessels towards the surface are very small. So what does that mean about blood flow there? It's minimal. It's minimal. And then when you get deeper, you see larger vessels, which means you have more blood flow. So like when we inject people with different shots or different medications, it's usually hypodermic because that's where the larger vessels are. Does that make sense? Putting it here does nothing. Putting it right here does absolutely nothing unless you're doing an allergy test. Okay? So the epidermis, the dermis, and then the hypodermis. You can also see here that this is where all of your accessory structures are. That's what we're going to end up calling them. Here, these, each individual hair has a muscle attached to it. Right here, these are your oil glands. We'll end up calling them sebaceous glands. Here is, are your sweat glands. Most people know that red is arteries. It should be oxygen rich. There are two exceptions, and we'll learn those later. And then blue would be oxygen poor blood, so going back to the heart. Anything in yellow besides the fat, most people are good with the, what the fat kind of looks like. Anything in yellow is um, denoting that it's nervous tissue. So that's some type of sensor. Okay, so those are sensory structures of some sort. All of this right here, this is all nerves. Okay, so it would be what we call innervated. This is vascular innervated tissue if we're looking at the dermis. Okay, so I just kind of wanted to show you that. You're going to see those diagrams again. But here's the first slide where it says the, the skin or the integument has two distinct regions, the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is superficial and composed of epithelial tissue. The dermis is beneath that, or lies beneath that, inferior to that. And it is composed of connective tissue. So remember, we only have two type, or four types of tissue. Uh, epidermal, not epidermal, epithelial, connective, muscular, and what's the last one? nervous. Yes, nervous. We have here, we have epithelial and we have connective tissue. The hypodermis. It's subcutaneous, and we learned this term the last time we were together. So cutaneous is referencing the skin, so sub-Q means beneath the skin. The hypodermis is mostly adipose. It serves to absorb shock and to insulate. Okay, it also helps to anchor the skin to the underlying structures as well as keep them separate from that. We kind of discussed that um, briefly, and we'll come into it. We'll discuss a little bit further today. Now... This first section, so that was just like the intro. Now all we're going to focus on is the epidermis. Okay, so this is the most superficial layer, the epidermis. Right here, it shows you that there are five layers to the epidermis. This is the bottom layer. So basal tells us this is the bottom. This is the most reticular, the deepest layer. Here is the superficial layer. So it goes the basal layer, spinosal layer, granulosum, lucidum, and corneum. Stratum is just telling you that it's the layer. Okay, so this is from bottom to top. Here it shows you the four types of cells we'll find in the epidermis. Keratinocytes, melanocytes, dendritic cells, and tactile cells. And we'll talk about each specifically. Okay, so we're just referencing the epidermis right now. 
Anybody have questions so far? We're good. So what do we need to know the layers from bottom to top or top to bottom? Either way. Yes. Okay. As long, just as long as you know them in order. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, here's a cross section, and um, this comes out of the integument lab, but you guys aren't doing the integument lab. You're going to the skeletal system. But here is dermis, the dermal tissue. And I did mention this last week, but I'm going to point it out again, especially for those of you who are going to go into like a clinical or hospital setting. When you look at any type of diagram and it kind of reflects back or it's light, that tells you that that's connective tissue. And that's consistent with scarring. But our dermis is a connective tissue, so it kind of reflects back pretty light. So this is a good marker for me on this slide to tell me where I am. This is one of those little dermal papillae one of those ridges that I told you that are unique to each of us. So here is my dermis. Then here begins my epidermis. I have my basal layer. Then I have my spinosal layer, granulosal layer, and corneal layer. This right here is what we call thin skin because it only has four layers. Thick skin is anywhere on your body where there's no hair, like your palms, the soles of your feet, your lips. That's all thick skin, and it has five layers, okay? In this case right here, this one just has four layers. The corneal layer, the top most superficial layer being the thickest of them all. The four types of cells, keratinocytes. Do you remember what site means? Mature. mature, yes. So blasts are the young ones, sites are the more mature cells. Keratinocytes are cells that are packed full of the protein keratin. And keratin does what for us? I mentioned this last week too, but it was like in passing. It wasn't something you had to memorize. It waterproofs us. Keratinocytes are cells that produce keratin, the protein keratin. And keratin waterproofs us. Okay, so we're going to see a lot of keratin, especially in our epidermis. Melanocytes. Many of you have heard of melanin or the pigment that you produce. Melanocytes are the cells that produce the pigment that cause you to be the color that you are. You are born with a set amount of melanocytes, so there's a set number of pigment producing cells in your skin already. And that controls the darkness or the lightness of your skin. The more fair skin you are, the less melanocytes you have, the less pigment you produce. The darker skin you are, the more melanocytes you have, the more pigment that you produce. This is genetic. You can't change it. So you can't say, oh, I want to be really, really dark, and you're really fair skin, and all of a sudden become really, really dark. You just don't have the cells to produce that pigment. Okay? And we'll talk about the importance of melanocytes, too, in a moment when we come to cancer. Dendritic cells. You're going to hear this term dendritic in two contexts. This is the first one. Dendritic cells here are talking about the cells that keep your skin healthy. This is like the immune system for your skin dendritic cells. So they are helping to keep this tissue healthy. The other context you will hear this is when we get to the nervous system, but this will come up again. Okay, so dendritic cells here, also called Langerhans cells. These are what take care of keeping bacteria or any type of antigens out. The last one are tactile cells. And what does it mean if something's tactile? To touch. These are touch sensors, touch receptors. So a lot of people can connect those two with that. So they allow you to say, oh, there's pressure, there's something touching me here. Four types of cells in our epidermis. Keratinocytes, melanocytes, and dendritic cells, and tactile cells. Questions on those four? Yes, ma'am. Just a question for the melanocytes. Mm -hmm. You know how you said you can't change your skin tone? Correct. Can you do with that? Okay, so great question. <clears throat> You have a set number of melanocytes. There are certain people who tan and they don't tan, they burn because they don't have the melanin that produces that pigment. They, they don't have the cells that produce the pigment, melanin. What melanin does for your cells? Your, each of your cells has a nucleus, and inside that nucleus is your DNA. So here's your cell, here's your nucleus, here's your DNA. Then we have melanocytes, depending on how light or dark you are, sp spread around that. Whenever UV rays hit your skin, melanocytes are stimulated to produce melanin. And what they do is they produce that pigment and it shades over the nucleus to protect it from UV damage. So when you become darker, that's actually a protective mechanism 
for the genetic material in your skin. But if you don't become darker, it's because you don't have the melanin to protect that, and so you're actually at more risk for developing skin cancer. Or burning. Mm -hmm. Or burning and then causing mutations, which will ultimately turn to skin cancers. Yeah? Good question. Good question, good question. Okay. Now we're going to go through each layer starting from the bottom. So the bottom is the basal layer. The characteristics of the basal layer, basically, because it's closest to the blood and it's closest to the nutrients, the basal layer is where all the baby cells are. These are nice, thick, plump, and healthy cells because they're eating well, they're living well. Okay? It mentions that here. This layer is not only called the basal layer, but also the germinativum layer. When it germinates, it grows. So this is the layer that grows. This is where our new skin cells come from, the bottom. Okay, it also mentions that there are stem cells there. Anytime you hear stem cells, that means that there's a chance for new tissue to be replenished, which is exactly why if you were to cut your skin, new cells would develop because there are skin cells, stem cells present. Okay, it mentions that they're actively mitotic. We talked about mitosis last week. Mitosis is when a cell divides in order to make a new one. Melanocytes are found in your basal layer. So your pigment-producing cells are found in your basal layer, okay? Which is really important because that's the layer that they would be protecting. So the basal layer. <clears throat> the layer above that. So one layer up, we have the spinosum layer. The spinosum layer is named because of the way it looks. As these cells age, they move more superficial. They move towards your surface. As they move towards the surface, guess what they move away from? Blood. So as they get away from blood, the oxygen and nutrients, they start to dehydrate. But do you recall last week we talked about a skeletal structure inside of the cell called the cytoskeleton? Literally, the cell skeleton. So if you were to dehydrate and start shriveling up, would your bones dehydrate and shrivel up? No. They kind of stick out. And so we call this the spinosum layer because as that cell starts to shrivel up, its bones stick out. So it kind of has this prickly look to it. Okay? So this is the first of a few times that it continues to dehydrate. So it's called the prickly layer because it starts to kind of stick out. We see melanosomes and dendritic cells here. This is making sure that our skin is healthy, helping to clean up any bacteria or antigens that may be there. It mentions here that we have pre-keratin filaments. We aren't going to preserve these cells yet because they're still alive. They're on their last limb, but they're still alive. So we're not going to put a coffin in them yet. That's why it's pre-keratin. Once they're full of keratin, they're completely dead. So by the time they reach the surface of your skin, they're full of keratin. They're all preserved. But right now we just say pre-keratin. We're getting them ready to be preserved because we know they're on their way out. The further away they get from this, the blood supply, the more uh, dehydrated they'll become. So this is the second layer. We went basal spinosum. Then we went granulosum. Granulosum is the granular layer. This is starting to talk about the nucleus. It's starting to kind of have this grainy appearance as it starts to die. Everything's kind of just dying because it's getting further away from blood, the oxygen and nutrients. So the nuclei and the organelles begin to disintegrate. The cells become flatter, and keratinization begins. We know that that cell's on its way out, that it's dying. We're going to go ahead and start producing keratin to preserve it after it dies. We don't preserve it while it's alive, but we preserve it after it's dead. <clears throat> Every cell above this layer is considered dead. So this is that transition period. Bless you. Because they're too far from the blood supply. So when it says they're too far from dermal capillaries, they're too far from the blood supply. Okay? Thick skin is the stratum lucidum. The lucidal layer is only what you'll see in areas where you have no hair, because this is a thick layer, and it prevents the hair growth. So on the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, 
This is also the skin that easily forms calluses because there's an accumulation of cells that can get stuck there. And um, what else can happen here? Um, I already said soles of your feet. So it's dead cells. They're all full of keratin, of course, because they're waterproof. Um, it's a clear layer, only found in thick skin. There was something else I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. Anyways, thick skin only. This is the layer that's only present in thick skin, not in thin skin. The corneal layer is also called the horny layer because at the very top, they're completely dead. And so what's their skeleton doing? It's just sticking out. And it, it looks like a sticker, um, like those seeds in the ground that stick to your socks and you call them like stickers. Or I don't know what you call them. People call them all kinds of things. But they stick to you. That's what those cells look like. By this time, they're flat. They're anucleate. What does that mean? There's no nucleus. A nucleate. A means lacking. So they're lacking their nucleus. They're completely keratinized. They're dead. There's multiple rows. So is that simple or stratify? Stratify. stratify. And it is protecting the deeper layers. Okay, so now they're on the surface. They're the first line, front line defenses. They're protecting from um, abrasion, tearing, anything like that. Okay. Um, and I mentioned that here, yes. Okay, so that's your very top, most superficial layer. And that's where you find the most of your cells. Those are the most of your, your uh, epidermal cells. Okay? <clears throat> you and I talked about differentiation. And in fact, I even mentioned this statistic last week. Differentiation is when a cell is told what it's going to do. So, if I use this with my high school seniors, this really isn't going to work out for you guys. But if you guys were all graduating this year, you would be the seniors of 2019. Five years from now, would you still be the class of 2019? Yes. But are you still a senior? Hopefully not. Hopefully you've moved on, right? And some of you have become teachers or firefighters or cooks or janitors or whatever it is that you want to become, a nanny, stay-at-home mom, all that awesome stuff, okay? You differentiate it. It's because you turn certain genes on and other genes off. Because your genes only have two options. They can either be on or off. Cell differentiation. Whenever our cells are in our epidermis and they get closer to the corneal layer, eventually they need to die. What's that program cell death called again? Apoptosis. Apoptosis is program cell death. We want our cells to die. Why? We don't want them to mutate. And what are we're going to replace them. If we continue to make cells and we keep the cells that we have, you're going to be huge. So you're constantly, constantly getting rid of the cells that you no longer need. As they get old, we break them down. We tell them, you don't need to be here anymore. Do you remember what organelle destroys them? Lysosomes. The lysosomes. It goes inside and it just releases all those acids and it digests that cell and you pee it out and you don't even know about it. As far as on your skin, you shed around 50,000 cells every minute, just, and that's what causes dust. The majority of dust is actually human skin cells. Yeah, now you know, right? That's all you, me too, I mean, it's all of us. But um, actually our skin is supposed to fall off a little bit faster, but you and I put a cosmetic twist on it because we don't like the way dry skin looks. So when we put lotion on it, we actually keep those cells there a little bit longer than they need to because we like the way it looks. We like that it's soft. And, but that's the dry skin part is what aids in all those cells falling off. Not many people like dry skin. Okay. Here is showing you an animated diagram with the different layers of cells. Starting with, again, you have your dermis down here, which is not part of your epidermis. This is connective tissue. Then you have your basal layer. And you can see your different types of cells here at the bottom where we have a lot of blood flow. And then you begin to move yourself up to your spinosal, granulosal, and then corneal layer there. And you can kind of see how flat and dehydrated they become as they make their way to the top. Okay? Again, the whole reason because they've lost access to nutrients. Questions here on the epidermis. Okay. Dermis, which is immediately below the epidermis. Dermis is composed of connective tissue. 
And there's two layers of the dermis, and you and I are going to divide this up. Of course, it couldn't just be one layer. But what I did point out in that diagram was that there was a lot of yellow, which are the nerve fibers. There was blood vessels. There was red and blue. These are colors that on your diagrams need to start popping out to you. Like you're like, okay, if it's yellow, I know that's nervous tissue. If it's red, I know that's oxygen rich. Most people say, well, that's an artery. We have two exceptions to that, so it's incorrect to say it's always an artery. And the blue means that it's oxygen poor. We haven't got to lymphatics yet, but if it's green, it's a lymphatic cell or a lymphatic tissue. Okay? So if you start to see these different colors, those things start to sh uh, pop out at you, it helps you understand what's going on in that tissue and what's possible. Okay? It mentions here different types of cells. Fibroblasts, we've mentioned already as part of the extracellular matrix, macrophages, immune. Occasionally mast cells. Anytime you see mast cells, that means you're having some type of reaction to something. An allergic reaction, an immune system response, an inflammatory reaction. If mast cells are present, that's telling us your body is sending out a, uh, I need a little bit of help here. Okay, so when you take blood and you're, you're analyzing it, if mast cells are present, that tells us that, that somebody, whoever it is that you're looking at, has had some type of reaction to something. White blood cells will have five types of white blood cells, so depending on which white blood cells are there, we can also diagnose what problems those, that individual has, and that's 2402 when we talk about that. Okay, the two layers of the dermis are the papillary and the reticular. I mentioned in Chapter 1 that a lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes the term reticular is used instead of deep. So this is another application of that. So the papillary layer is right beneath the epidermis, and then right beneath that is the reticular layer. Here's this same diagram from a moment ago. We had our four slash five layers of the epidermis, and right now we're here in the dermis. Basically, the way this works out is here's your papillary layer, just this thin all the way around, thin first few micrometers, and then we have the rest of it as being our reticular layer. Okay, so the thin layer is just beneath the epidermis, and then the reticular layer is everything underneath it. So that's how it's divided, and you can see that here that it's designating that for you there. Okay. In the papillary layer, the reason the papillary layer is so thin is because it's just responsible for our dermal papilla. Our dermal papilla are those little ridges that you saw there, and they're very unique to each of us. So the ridges that I have will not match the ridges that you have. They cause my body fi fingerprint, they cause your body to have its fingerprint as well. We also have elastic fibers here. If there's elastic fibers, we've discussed this, what does that tissue have the ability to do? Stretch. stretch and recoil. And we like that ability, that it can stretch and recoil. It also has collagen. And collagen is strength and durability. So it's kind of flexible but durable. So you want that right beneath your skin as well. There's phagocytes there. Phagocytes are able to help engulf any type of antigen that's there. So this is part of your biological barrier to help kill anything that might be trying to infiltrate your body. Again, the dermal papilla are the main focus for the dermis, the papillary layer of the dermis. <clears throat> this whole slide goes through the dermal papilla, but ultimately what they are are the ridges that form your fingerprints. They're unique to us. And of course, we have scientists or, or people who that's what they study is the science, that the folding of your fingerprints so that they can identify each person. Some of those dermal papilla have what we call Meisner's corpuscles. These are touch receptors that you feel with your hands. Of course, you have those corpuscles elsewhere as well. Some contain free nerve endings, and this means that it's sensitive to pretty much anything. It's not necessarily just sensitive to touch, but it can get information from anything. And in thick skin, in thick skin, so where am I talking about if there's thick skin? No hair. Your palms are your hands, the soles are your feet. Atop those dermal ridges, they, those cause what we call the epidermal ridges. And that's truly what you reference as your fingerprint. You don't think about this area having its own design, although it does. This is where we really map people out. Okay? And these are unique to everyone. They're collectively called the friction ridges. Of course, they enhance your ability to grip things, which is why they're there. 
but they are very unique to each of us and cause our fingerprints or our footprints, which are, again, unique, unless you have an identical twin. If you have an identical twin and you have the exact same genetic material, you have the exact same epidermal ridges, you have the exact same fingerprint and footprints. So if you're into forensics and stuff like that, there's quite a few cases where one twin does something and the other twin goes down for it because they have the exact same fingerprints. I thought, so I'm going to have an identical twin, I thought that everything was the same with identical twins, including DNA, except for the You The fingerprints are the same as well. There's multiple cases um, that they can pull unless they've been manipulated, or like if you have like a cut or something that you experienced that, that one of you didn't, and it caused a scar, then that of course is going to make it different. But um, there are, there's plenty, plenty of court cases, plenty of scientific evidence that backs up. And in fact, they'll even have, like, soak, some of the twins will soak their fingers in acid to burn and scar so that they don't have the same fingerprint as the one. Like, there's so many crazy cases of bad twins. <laughs> so is the epidermal ridge and then the friction ridge the same? Thing yes. So the epidermal ridges are used for friction. So they're referred to as friction ridges, epidermal ridges. Like they're just causing that that gripping nature. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Both good points. So here is an up close fingerprint slash. You can see the friction ridges, the epidermal, the dermal papilla. Everything that I just said there, it all applies. All those terms can pretty much be used interchangeably. This is a very high magnification that we're looking at them here with, but unique. Um, okay, still here. In the dermis, we have the reticular layer, which is a little bit further, or, or more reticular, deeper, than the uh, papillary layer. This, is the, this composes the majority of the dermis, packed full of elastic and collagen, so we see the same pattern there, just a lot more because it's a lot more tissue. It provides strength and resiliency, which we would expect when we have collagen and we have elasticity and all of that. But here's the key here is cleavage lines. And this isn't talking about cleavage lines in breasts. This is talking about cleavage lines where you naturally, your tissue naturally cleaves. And this is more for people who have surgery or um, who go in, uh, have plastic surgery. When they talk about the least scarring, this, this method has the least amount of scarring. And we can do this minimal scarring. It's because once we realize that we operate along the lines of cleavage, we can minimize the amount of scarring so there's no superficial damage that you can see and you can't really see that you've had that surgery. Cleavage lines are present in your reticular layer of your dermis. And I'm going to kind of show you what that looks like. I have a map on the next slide, I believe. These are externally invisible. But if you are a surgeon, you are a doctor, you know in the area that you has specialized in where the cleavage lines are. So if there's an emergency surgery, you don't normally follow lines of cleavage. I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. They will if it's a C-section now. But if it's a planned surgery and, you know, they know what they're doing, this is something that's routine, they will normally follow lines of cleavage to minimize the scarring unless it can't be, unless you can't get around it. Like sometimes when you have ankle surgery, they have to cut they have to cut straight down. Like they, that's the only way they can get to it. They can't do a nice cleavable cut along those lines to minimize that scarring. Here is a map of your cleavage lines. So, I don't know how many of you have had knee surgery, but if you have knee surgery, you probably have a big scar. Why? Because the cleavage lines go this way to get in, and they cut this way. What we find is if we can cut along the line of cleavage, like if I can cut along this line right here, the tissue comes back very nicely and it won't pucker as much when I go to suture it, when I sew it together with stitches, okay? So in the old days, let's say like the 80s, you had a baby, you had a C-section, they cut this way. And a lot of those women had scars down their abdomen and if they sneezed or if they laughed really hard, it could it was danger of ripping that apart because it did not heal correctly. There was a big scar there. If they had children afterwards, they would have to have C-sections because even the pressure of bearing down to press to push the baby out could cause that muscle and that tissue to tear. 
Now, if you go in for a C-section, they cut along a line of cleavage lower, small little cut, cut into the uterus, pull the baby out, stitch it up, and we're done. Of course, it's traumatic, so you can't just get up and walk out. But it's a big deal, you know, you just had a baby. I don't want to minimize that at all. But the scarring is a lot less than it used to be. And all cosmetic surgeries that you get will follow lines of cleavage. And that's, well, unless you have a bad surgery. But they should follow a line of cleavage to minimize the scarring. But this map is basically under your epidermis and then your papillary layer. So we cut along that, we can get everything to suture up really nice and neatly, minimize the scarring. Lines of cleavage. Questions on the dermis. Okay. Flexure lines. Flexure lines are what, like when you look at your hand and the psychic or the palm reader reads all those. Those are your flexure lines. So um, that's where your skin naturally bends at the joints. So these are just flexure lines, so it tells you that. Dermal, uh, dermal folds near the joints, visible on your hands, wrists, fingers, soles, and toes. There's creases, so flexure lines. That's them there. Okay, striae and blisters. Striae is a fancy way of saying stretch marks. Um, striae is where whenever your skin stretches, the epidermis stretches, if it stretches too quickly, it tears. <clears throat> There's people who say that this is genetic and that is a fact because the amount of elasticity or amount of elastin that you have is genetic. Okay, you do have a gene for that elastin. So sometimes you just don't have a lot of elastin and when that skin stretches, that epidermis stretches, there's just no recoil. So it continues to stretch and then we expose the dermis. When the dermis is exposed, well, what color is the dermis? Why? It's a light, it, it's a reflective color. So when you get stretch marks, they're a brighter color. People say, well, when you go out in the sun, it makes them, it does make them worse. Because you can't make brighter, darker. There's no melanocytes in that. So if you darken the skin around it, that stretch mark tends to stand out because that dermis is exposed. So a striate is just where that skin, the epidermis is torn. <laughs> And as a result, the dermis is exposed, and that's what causes stretch marks. <clears throat> they say you can use these different creams, different moisturizers and stuff to minimize stretch marks. And the goal is that those creams or moisturizers have, they don't have elastin, but they allow for the, the, um, supple, the suppleness, I'm looking for an adjective right now, I can't think of it, of your skin, so that it can kind of give a little bit more. So like, for example, if you have a woman who is having a baby and she puts like that cocoa butter, that shea butter on her belly, it moistens that skin so it's more stretchy and supple, less likely to have a stretch mark. Um, but that doesn't mean that you won't get them, okay? And so I don't want to say, oh, that's going to solve everything because it doesn't. I'm just saying that that's the science behind it. All right, so a stretch mark. Um, as far as how to get rid of them, there's a lot of topical creams. They claim that they can do it. A lot, of, a few of them stimulate the growth of your epidermis, um, but they're the more expensive ones. They're not like the ones that you can just get, like, you know. But anyways, you go to a doctor and you get those um, creams, and they can stimulate the stem growth, uh, skin cell growth, and try to, to minimize that stretch mark. A blister is just where the epidermis and dermis have separated. Why? <laughs> Why do blisters fill up with water or with fluid? Because your sweat glands are in your dermis. And whenever your dermis and your epidermis separate, the sweat that would normally leave your epidermis is stuck there. So it fills up in that pocket. And then whenever that blister ruptures, that, that epidermis, because it, it's skin, so the epidermis is eventually going to tear and die and it's going to, it's going to be just fine later. But all of that fluid that comes out is really just a bunch of sweat that got stuck there. Now, could there be antigens and bacteria and stuff there as well? Yes. Why do they say not to pop a blister? Because there's no protective layer for that dermis immediately. You need to give it a minute to, to do that. But sometimes they're very uncomfortable and people do it anyway, and then you just wash it, treat it, make sure that you keep that area clean, and you should be just perfectly fine. Maybe a little uncomfortable because when a blister 
because that skin is sensitive, but you should be okay. <clears throat> the color of your skin. You have three skin pigments. Melanin, carotene, and uh, hemoglobin. Melanin we've already talked about. Carotene is not keratin. Keratin is waterproofing with a K, is waterproofing. Carotene with a C is an orangish, yellowish pigment. Okay, so one's a pigment and one's waterproofing, just so that you understand that. Hemoglobin is the color that you get because of your blood flow. So whenever they talk about somebody being really pale or their face going pale, it's because the blood flow is decreased. So that hemoglobin is what gives them that color because of their blood flow. Okay, so not a couple of those you really can't do anything about. So melanin is a reddish to yellow slash brownish to black pigment. It really just depends on your genes and what proteins that you're making. Okay, the amount depends on your genes and what you're making. The color, the darkness, all of that is genetic. Freckles and pigmented moles are nothing more than a bunch of melanocytes that are together producing a bunch of pigment and they're just there. Okay, those are all genetic, like freckles and not freckles. Some people have them and some people don't. Sun exposure stimulates the production of melanin, and we discussed that actually prematurely, which is totally fine because it worked out. When you have sunspots, sunspots actually have absolutely nothing to do with the sun. They actually, uh, it's just fungus that's grown on your skin, and I know that that sounds horrible right now because you're like, oh my gosh. But it is, and it's actually quite common. Many of us do have that fungus growing on our skin, but you don't see it until you're out in the sun, and it kind of shows up. And... Um, I, I mean, all my kids have this, like, really pretty brown skin, and I just thought that they had sunspots, and I went to the doctor, and she's like, no, she's got, like, a fungus on her face, and I was like, oh, um, that's not healthy, surely. She's like, no, it's actually really common. I said, so what do you do to get rid of it? She said, just wash it with dandruff shampoo. Head and shoulders, put it on there, and it'll dry it up, and you'll be good. And I was like, okay, well, now I know. Now I know that that's what that is. So sunspots are not from the sun, they're from fungus. That we are actually all pretty, pretty much prone to. Carotene is a yellowish to an orangish pigment. Um, it's gonna give us a yellowish slash orangish slash color, depending on genetics. You're gonna see this color more in Mediterranean slash Asian people. Um, they have that, that, that kind of like it's not tan, but it's in between. They have a higher level of carotene. That's also because of their diet. When you eat a lot of yellow and orange um, foods like squash and carrots and you eat that in high amounts, it actually changes the pigment of your skin. And that's a common practice for people who aren't happy with the color of their skin, like eating a bunch of shrimp that has canthraxanthum. It gives you a tan color. Okay, it's also really bad for your kidneys, but it gives you the color that you're looking for. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of, it's crazy, like I read all these research studies, but a lot of bodybuilders do that because they want to have that natural bronze look. But you have to get Canthrax Anthem from shrimp, from brine, and I'll, I was like, oh my gosh, they go to great details to, um, to have this nice tan look, which is, I guess, kind of orange when you look at it. But anyway, so it just gives you different colors, different, and we have a different spectrum of color at this point. We can't just say, well, you're white and you're black and you're brown. It's just not like that anymore. We have all of these different shades. So your color is a, is a work of all of these together. And it brings hemoglobin here at the very end. That's the pinkish hue of your skin as a result of blood flow. When there's no blood flow to that tissue, you do lose color because increased blood flow causes you to turn like a reddish color. So when they're like, oh, you're blushing, literally it's because there's an increase of blood flow to that tissue, okay? When that blood flow is not there, it turns very pale, and it impacts what that color looks like. So three things impacting the color of your skin, melanin, carotene, and hemoglobin. Questions on skin pigmentation. All right, other colors of your skin that aren't necessarily healthy. Cyanotic, and most of us have heard of this, especially if you've been in the medical setting in any um, in any capacity. But cyano cyanosis or a cyanotic patient is one that has like a bluish greenish color to that tissue. That usually tells us that what's not there? Oxygen. There's no blood flow to that tissue. 
and this is not a good thing. But we also see it in patients who are really cold. And um, even if you have small children and they're like shivering because they're in a swimming pool, like you might notice like a blue, bluish color to their lips, that's cyanotic. That's what that is. So when you see that color, that basically tells us there's no blood flow or low oxygen to that area. Arrhythmia. Erythro, anything tells me red. So arrhythmia is like a red-ish color. Okay? And whenever something's really red, that tells us that it's running a fever probably or it's inflamed to some degree could be infected, it, it indicates to us that there's a problem. So when you see a bunch of reddish, then that tells us that there's something not right. Pallor or a blanching, that's where it, all color is gone and you have that like white look to you. That could be that someone's had low blood sugar, it could be that they're scared, um, it could be a few things, but that's something that we use to diagnose them because we know that that's not normal for that individual, unless you are somebody just rolling up on that scene. Like it's very difficult for first responders to, to immediately diagnose someone. That's why they just try to respond based on what they see. Jaundice is where they have a yellowish color to them. You see this in infants. We treat it with phototherapy, meaning we just put them in light. That's what phototherapy is. And it's, it's a, because their bilirubin hasn't broken down, so it's kind of giving them this yellow color. It's liver function. We see this in patients who have hepatitis um, that have had it for a really long time because their, their liver function is, is kind of decreasing. Uh, cirrhotic livers, uh, fatty liver disease, we see that. If there's an, a liver condition, over time we'll be able to see um, in the eyes and kind of the skin color that jaundice or that yellowish look. A bronzing is usually, um, not that they are tanning, but like they get bronze here um, or bronze on their forehead only, that's an indication that that individual may have Addison's disease. That's pretty specific just to get bronzing in that area. So, um, and that usually shows up in females, not males. Bruising, that's just a blood clot underneath the skin. So you just have blood beneath the skin. And eventually, with enough um, time, that, that blood will go away depending on how big or small that bruise is. It just depends. Hopefully there's no like thick clot though. The goal is that it cleans itself out. Okay, anything on skin? Because we're about to go to appendages right now. So epidermis, dermis, anything like that so far. Okay, appendages of skin are what we would call accessory structures. You have the hair, nails, sweat glands, which really sweat, and then sebaceous is what our, we, we will end up calling our oil glands. So anything sebum, sebaceous, anything like that, it's going to be oil. Oil of some sort. Okay, hair. We have lots of different types of hair on the human body. <clears throat> it talks about, first of all, just the generalized structure, that hair is packed full of keratin. You hear this all the time. Um, shampoos, they market towards that. This shampoo will put more keratin in your hair. You can't put more keratin in your hair. Your hair is dead and it's not accepting anything. Okay, it's just the look that it gives you. It makes it thicker. It usually puts an oil coating on that hair. Talks about that hair is not uh, not present in areas that have thick skin. So again, like the palms, the soles of your feet, your lips, your nipples, and portions of your external genitalia. Anywhere that there's thick skin, there will not be hair. Like it just can't grow because it can't get through that layer. The functions of hair. Sunlight, heat loss, physical trauma. First of all, when you walk outside, do you have to look at the sun to feel the heat coming from you? No, you feel it. Your hair tells us that. I told you every single hair has a muscle on it. Every single hair has a nerve. That's why when you pluck out a hair, it hurts. You're like, hey, like you feel that. Because every single one of them has a job. It's a sensory organ for you. It tells us the sun is there. Heat loss when we're sweating. Physical trauma, it tells you that you've been cut. It tells you where you've been cut. You never get cut and don't have a general idea where. Now, let me, let me not say never. If you're in like a crazy traumatic situation, like a car accident and stuff like that, it is very possible that because your adrenaline levels being so incredibly high that you don't realize you're hurt. That's possible. But that is only temporary. Does that make sense? The warning of the insects on your skin. And whenever an insect lands on your back, do you have to know that it's there? Do you have to see it? No, you're like, something's on my back. Like, and a lot of times, like, if you feel it, you, like, slap it or whatever, because you know it's there. Each of those hairs is a sensory organ. Hairs have different pigments. 
based on genetics, okay? Based on genetics. Now, the gray is not based on genetics. That's because you're getting older, okay? So that's, that's just part of life. But melanins can be a different color based on what genes you express and which ones you don't express. But gray or white hair, we talked about peroxisomes the other day. There's a decreased melanin production because as you age, the melanin levels go down. Every system kind of goes downhill unless you maintain it. And then we have more air in those, um, air bubbles in those hair shafts. So it kind of, it, that hair doesn't, if that melanin, it's got hydrogen peroxide, it's got all, and it just starts to bleach it. And it's a slow process, thank goodness, but it does do that, yes. So me and my sister have had gray hair since we were 21. Yeah. But why would it? So your melanin so production just decreased early on. And you guys, you, I don't know if she's as fair skinned as you are. But yeah, so if, she, if that's the case, then yeah. It's not a surprising thing that you don't have a lot of melanin anyway. So if you don't have a lot, then it stops functioning, then you're gray quicker. I know that that's not what you mean. <laughs> it's the truth. All right, hair follicles. So when you talk about a hair follicle, what we're going to look at right now is the overall anatomy of the hair. We're going to bring up all these terms. I'm going to go to the diagram first because I truly am not a person that you can just read me these terms and expect me to know all of this. So here is the hair. It extends through the epidermis into the dermis. Hair can't grow here because there's no blood. Hair has to start in your dermis where there's blood flow and nutrients. Okay, that's why your hair grows. These cells here are actively growing. But as they get closer to the surface, they die, just like your skin. So all the hair you have on the outside is all dead. And you've probably, a lot of you may have already known that, but that's how that works. What we're looking at here, here's the root. Here's where I'm going to get all my nutrients. These cells right here are the active stem cells. Okay, when you pull a whole hair out right here and you get all of this, there, the hair could potentially not grow back. A lot of times it does, especially if you're younger, but the older you get, the less likely it is to replace itself. All this tissue is here is support for that hair. Right here is an oil gland, which we were, we're going to end up calling a sebaceous gland, and this is what produces that oil that protects your hair. So some of you who have really thin hair, you have to wash it pretty often because the oil, once it's secreted, it gives you that oily, crazy looking hair. If you have thicker hair, the oil actually makes it look better so you can go three or four days without washing it and be fine. Some of you just wash your hair every day just because that's what you do. And that's totally fine, just addressing all the different hair types. Terms that we're going to be seeing over and over again, cortex and medulla. Medulla tells me it's in the middle. Cortex tells me it's on the outside. That's across the board no matter what organ you're looking at. So you're going to hear those terms a lot um, as you go through anatomy and physiology. Cortex is on the outside. Medulla is there in the middle. So here's my active dividing. Here's my outside of my hair. It's full of keratin and so on. All of this is support here, but you can see that they're all cells. And then here is connective tissue. This is around every single hair in your body, on your body, every single hair on your body. Let me show you another picture. Here's a micrograph of that up close, so you can kind of see what it truly does look like. We did a cross section. This is a transverse cut up close. You have the exact same things labeled there as you did on the previous one. Here is my favorite because it's animated. I know it's not real, but still you can see the adipose. You can see the connective tissue. You can see the access that we have. Here's the melanocytes that color my hair, that tell my hair what color it needs to be, right? And then here, my medulla. Here's my cortex. This is all actively dividing. And then out here where they get thinner and longer, you can tell that they're getting further away from the oxygen and nutrients. They're starting to dehydrate, and they'll leave. So hair, the anatomy of a hair. One more slide on that. So. Let's go back here real quick. The hairball, it's telling you that this is part in the dermis and it extends through the epidermis. We have no livingness on our epidermis. Our epidermis can't support it. The hair matrix is the part that we call the actively dividing area, so it's very at the very bottom. The muscle that each hair has is called the erector pili muscle. And I already mentioned this when we talked about negative feedback, but that muscle is responsible for when it contracts, it causes our hair to stand up, which is what gives us goosebumps, and it produces heat. 
that, but also it was a protective mechanism that whenever that muscle contracts, it makes the hair stand up on your body, it makes you look larger and more intimidating. And whenever you see an animal like a dog or a bear or something, they, their hair begins to stand up, it's because of that muscle. They have that same exact muscle. Every single hair on your body has one muscle attached to it. The papilla is where the blood supply is. And where the blood supply is, it's actively dividing that matrix. Here's showing you this muscle right here. I don't think I pointed that out. But every hair has its own muscle. Okay, the types of hair. Do we have the same type of hair all over our body? The answer is no. Vellus hair is that fine body hair. We usually see this on children, small children. Uh, women, like on their shoulders, their back, it's just a pot of fine body hair, and um, not coarse or anything like that. Terminal hair is like what you find in your eyebrows, okay? Uh, pubic hair is terminal hair, it's like a coarse feeling hair. Nutrition and hormones affect hair growth. If your hair grows really well now because you eat really well and your hormone levels are good, that's great. If you change your diet, it's possible that in three months your hair can have a totally different makeup. Flip is also true. If you have a really crappy diet right now and you change the way that you eat and the way you take care of yourself, it can improve the health of your hair. Your hair is a really good long-term timeline for us. It tells us your basic nutrition overall. We can use that to study an individual. Okay? Do your hair does cycle between active and regressive phases um, when you're pregnant? A lot of women, because their hormone levels are higher, they, some of their hair falls out because the hormones shock their body, and some women grow thicker hair because of that. So it really just depends on that individual. So that's a, that would be an active cycle. On average, your hair is growing two and a quarter millimeters a week, and you lose around 90 hairs a day. Your hair is just spinning. Okay? And that's mostly because you're like brushing it out, and if you don't brush your hair, then it's not because you're brushing it out. Okay? Alopecia. Alopecia is just where your hair thins. And it's a condition where you grow hair, but it's just really thin. So you can see their scalp. Um, you see this, and it's, it's usually um, early on. Like, you expect to see this in, like, people who are 60, 70, 80. This is usually, like, in their late 30s, going into their 40s, that they start to have that thinning hair. Frank or true baldness. That's genetic. And I mentioned the other day, I, don't, I think it was this class I was talking to, but that's determined by your mother's father, usually. Mother's father, um, it determines your hair pattern. So if he's bald, um, if he's not bald and he's got a nice healthy head of hair, well then, you're good. It mentions here that there are treatments for this, and you they're all over TV. Um, we can paint your head and make it look like you have hair, or we can stimulate your head, your scalp, and try to um, implant hairs on you. There was one company that was taking hair from people getting their hair cut and like attaching it to your head. There's just different ways. There's different ways. And that's, I mean, that does bother, the thought process does bother me. I get it. Um, but I don't know. So like Rogaine with Minoxidil, these are all uh, treatments uh, over the counter. Some of them you have to buy, prescribe. It just depends. Nails. Nails are a our evolution's way of replacing scales with something a little bit thicker. And for some of us, our nails are still really thin even though they're supposed to be thicker. So nails are our version of scales. They protect the delicate ends of our appendages. So if you remove the nail, it is very tender, very delicate beneath it. So your nails do serve a purpose of protection. For people who bite their nails, when you bite it too low, it hurts because there's that um, capillary bed is right there underneath it. This is a, a sensory organ. Your fingers, your flanges, and your toes are all sensory organs. So they help us to sense our environment. This is just a protection for those um, very, very delicate surfaces. So it mentions that they protect or cover the distal dor dorsal surfaces of the fingers and toes. And Maybe this is a, real, a reference to kind of what you were saying, but a lot of times people understand it when I explain it to them and they get it when we can talk about it like this, but it's whenever you read it in this context that you have to be able to make sense of it. So, and I may be totally off on that, and this is just a stab in the dark, but 
when you see that it says protective cover for distal dorsal surface of fingers and toes. Like you have to be able to, distal means far from the point of attachment, dorsal means the back, right? Like put all that stuff together. Some of you got that and some of you are just maybe on that, that brink, I'm not sure, but that could also be a thing is we just have to learn how to apply the words and how to, to dissect those questions. Okay, of course, many people again know that their nails contain keratin. Um, a lot of women and men take vitamins that increase the amount of keratin their body produces to make their nails or hair thicker and prettier. So that's what that is there. This is a good diagram of a nail. Um, right here, what we call our cuticle is technically called the eponychium. And this really, really sensitive part that if you hit right underneath that it just like not paralyzes you, but you're like, ah, and it's just something really tiny. That's your hyponychium. So hyponychium, eponychium. Why can't we just call it cuticle in the, under the nail? Because this is anatomy. We have to make things difficult. But those are usually the ones that catch people. Most everybody else can come up with the other things, like your phalange. You can see the fat. You can see the muscle tissue. You can see the nail itself. Like all of that is pretty straightforward. But the eponychium and the hypo hyponychium are what usually get people. So now that I pointed that out, hopefully it doesn't get you. Sweat glands produce and secrete sweat. <clears throat> sweat is a water base. It mentions here that we have two types of sweat glands, eccrine or meroprine sweat glands and apocrine sweat glands. They contain myoepithelial cells. You're familiar with epithelial, but myo tells me it's muscle. So there is muscle within these epithelial cells. And if I'm a gland, why does it benefit me to have muscle? So that I can contract. So whatever I've created, I can get rid of. So if it's sweat or oil, I can contract and it'll shoot up whatever that secretion is. So myo tells me muscle, epithelial, of course, tells me it's exposed to the surface, okay, or the environment. So it mentions that they contract. Ecrine sweat glands or merocrine sweat glands are our standard sweat glands. Apocrine are modified sweat glands, and so I'll mention that in a moment. Where are we going to see these sweat glands? Also called pseudoriferous. It is there bolded. Pseudoriferous glands. On every skin surface except for the nipples, which are thick skin, and the external genitalia. Ecrine sweat glands are uh, abundant on the palms. Notice how I didn't say thick skin when it said nipples and external genitalia. You do sweat on your palms, and some of you are well aware of that because your hands will get all sweaty, like when you get nervous, when you shake someone's hand, you're like, I'm sorry, your hands are sweaty. You still sweat if you have thick skin. There's just no sweat glands in, on, around your nipples and your external genitalia. So that's what that's referencing. You have these glands also um, on your forehead. Every single one of them has a duct. This is a throwback to a previous chapter. If it has a duct, we call it exocrine or exocrine, which means it has a specific destination. We don't just release sweat in our body and hope it makes its way out. It has a destination. We expect it to leave. Okay, the eccrine sweat glands, Function in thermoregulation. What's thermoregulation? Making us regulate our body temperature, keeping us warmer or cold, okay? The secretion from the eccrine sweat glands is sweat, so it's mostly water, salts, vitamin C, antibodies. There's a lot of different things. We also call it dermison. Your skin, when you sweat, actually tries to keep microbes from growing on you. I will tell you that that's pretty, it, it works out pretty efficiently unless you don't shower, which may or may not happen sometimes. Sometimes you go work out, you get really sweaty, and you're so worn out from that workout that you just go home and sleep. We see that over time you do this a few times, and you start to form like rashes. Um, in areas that you don't wash enough, that sweat builds up, and it's a perfect little environment for bacteria. And they're like, oh, okay. And they live there, and you get a rash. So that's a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not sure what's happening. A lot of times a rash can be taken care of with a shower, a good washing real quick. Okay, especially if it's something like that. Okay, I'm showing you sweat glands. These are sweat glands. There's another one anywhere on. I don't see another one on there. 
sweat glands. The ones that are actually attached to the hair are the oil glands or sebaceous glands. Okay, apocrine sweat glands. Apocrine sweat glands were the other type of sweat gland that it mentioned down there. The apocrine sweat glands are modified sweat glands. So it mentions that they're confined to the axillary and anogenital areas. Their sweat is not like a sweat sweat. It's a sweat mixed with like an oilishness. Okay, so a sweat and a fatty substance. Their um, sweat could be viscous, which means it's thicker, milky, or yellowish. It's odorless if, if you're not producing odorants or you're washing yourself really quickly, but once you hit puberty, guess what happens? It starts to form this scent, and that's what a lot of times we reference as your body odor. So your apocrine glands are those glands that become active usually um, when we know that they're active at puberty, because we can smell you, okay, when they interact with bacteria. Um, it mentions a begin function of puberty. Modified glands, ceruminous glands. Ceruminous glands are what produce um, the earwax in your ear. So um, cerumen is a modified apocrine gland. So it's a modified sweat gland, your earwax. Mammary glands that secrete milk, those are modified sweat glands. They don't produce uh, sweat, they produce a viscous, milky solution. And that's milk. Well, a, a proponent of milk. Okay. Sebaceous glands are your oil glands. Your oil glands just secrete that oil. Um, they become most active at puberty. It mentioned on the previous slide that this gives you your, your unique sexual scent. Um, this does also play into that. Every individual does have a unique scent, and it's crazy, but you're only attracted to people you like the way they smell. You can be nice to pretty much anyone, but what keeps two people together is that you like the way they smell biologically with no cologne right out of the shower. So if you start dating someone and you're getting along really fine at the beginning and then all of a sudden it's not working out for you, when you break up with them, you tell them it's not you, it's your smell. Because <laughs> it, it's 100% biologically fact. If you don't like the way they smell, you will find something wrong with them. Like they don't close the toothpaste, they don't do this, they leave the door open all the time, they do this. You will find a way to get away from them without knowing that that's what you're doing. You have to like their smell, okay? So if you don't like someone's smell, it's not uncommon for you to kind of just stay away from them. You can be nice to anyone, but you don't have to like them, right? It's their smell. And so it mentions that. It mentioned that also on the previous slide. I didn't bring it up because I wanted to talk about the sweat as well. Sebum is what we call sweat, or <clears throat> not sweat, oil, and it is bactericidal. It's trying to kill bacteria, trying to keep things from growing on you. Ultimately, we don't want any microbes to be living on you, but we do know that they're present, which is why you have to shower and maintain your hygiene practices. If you don't maintain your hygiene practices and you continue to secrete oil and sweat, you start to get rashes, and, well, you know what happens there. Okay, so, another diagram of that. Overall functions of the integumentary, integumentary system, protection, obviously your skin is going to preserve function as a protective layer. Regulate your body temperature, help you sense things. Metabolic function, we're not talking about digesting food. Metabolism overall is catabolic and anabolic. We discussed that in chapter one. So it's actually helping synthesize vitamin D, the precursors to vitamin D. And it's a blood reservoir. You have blood in your skin most of the time. You should, unless there's no blood there for some reason. And excretion to help get rid of wastes. So we're going to go over each function and kind of delineate specifically what it does as far as protection goes. Your skin serves, as, or your integumentary system, I don't want to say skin. Your integumentary system serves as chemical barriers, physical barriers, and biological barriers. How so? For chemical barriers, your skin creates a small bactericidal antimicrobial reagent that it secretes on its surface to create a chemical barrier to keep microbes off. But again, if you leave it on there too long, it actually creates a, an environment that attracts microbes. It also produces melanin, depending on what your genetics allow, the amount of melanin that protects, it serves as a chemical barrier that protects your skin, protects your genetic material, your nuclei. Physical barriers, it's physically waterproof, and it's trying to keep what's out, out, and what's in, in. 
whenever um, I talked about the fact that our skin wants to be dry so that it can kind of peel off, we look at lotions and um, advertisement and marketing for these lotions, and they're like, well, this will penetrate through your skin. In order to penetrate through our skin, it's going to have to be some pretty robust ingredients. You can't just put lotion on your skin and expect it to soak all the way down to your bloodstream because it's not going to. Your skin is multiple layers thick, it's stratified, and it's waterproof. So it's going to take some specific chemicals to get all the way through. So do most of the lotions and creams that you put on go all the way through your skin? The answer is no, but they make you feel nice, and, and, and I get it. That's what they're doing there. So there's limited penetration. Now guess what can go through pretty easily. And Adria had asked about this right before the test. Something that's lipid soluble. And we'll, we'll get through, we'll, we'll start talking about that, but if it can get through fats, that cell membrane, it's a lipid bilayer. Just let it right through. We have quite a bit of lipids in our body. Not that you should say someone is lipid because that's not a thing, but you have a huge lipid component in your body that's not just like fat, like storage fat. Okay? talks about the fact that um, you might be allergic to different things, and so we might see rashes and so on showing up. When those rashes show up, that's actually a protective mechanism that's telling our body that it's trying to keep it out. It's alerting us that there's been, there's been some type of contact, okay, so an attempted infiltration. And if you're allergic to it, well, then that's not good for you because it spreads pretty easily and it's irritating. Um, it continues to go on. So we could talk about each of those in detail, and we're not going to, but only certain things can get through your skin. It serves as a physical barrier. Biological barriers, talking about how our skin functions as a living unit, are dendritic cells. I mentioned that those are the macrophages, and they're supposed to catch up and engulf through endocytosis, things that don't belong, like bacteria and microbes. Okay, so there's a living area, a living layer of our skin. Macrophages do the same thing. DNA is a biomolecule that stores our genetic material. It's supposed to help us absorb heat, but it could also cause mutations if we do it too much, so we want to minimize that. Functions of the integumentary system continue with body regulation, with temperature regulation. If you're hot, you sweat. If you're cold, you do what? Shiver. We have sensible versus insensible perspiration. If you sweat and you know it, it's sensible. You sensed it. If you sweat and you don't know it, like you are right now, that's insensible perspiration. You're constantly sweating, but the amount of sweat tells you whether it's sensible or insensible. If you don't realize it, then it's insensible. Okay? Cutaneous sensations, that's just somebody touching you or something touching you. It allows you, whenever touched, that could be painful, it could be hot, it could be cold. So touch could be a lot of different things, just so you know it's not just touch. Metabolic function, it synthesizes vitamin D precursors. So it's not digesting your food, but it is carrying out metabolic processes. At any given time, you should have a small percentage of your blood in your integument, in your skin, which is giving you the color that you have. Okay, it's referencing around 5% of your body. Excretion to help get rid of waste, not only in sweat, but it could also be in sebum and so on. Skin cancers. We're only going to talk about three types of skin cancers, but whenever you see the term metastasize, first of all, there's benign and malignant. Does everyone know what the difference is here? Most people in our society right now are very up on the terms that go along with cancer. Benign means it's not harmful, malignant means it's harmful. Metastasize means that it has spread. In order for cancer to spread, it just needs one cell to break off. That's very easy to happen, and that can occur very quickly. If you're... Um, if you have just, here's one cancerous cell. Cancer is uncontrolled mitosis, so it will continue to divide. And because there's no room here, that tumor grows up. And it will continue to grow pretty quickly until it gets too far away from blood vessels. And then it will slow. This is stage one cancer. When the doctor says, okay, we see a tumor, we see something, we're going to watch and see what happens. This is where it's at. Stage two is when this tumor talks to the tissue around it and says, hey, <clears throat> I need some food. And you're like, that tissue around you is like, no, you don't belong here. I'm like, okay, I'll wait. 
How else you can hate that physics and food? Okay, pass food. That physics. And eventually what happens? That tissue gives in. And when I can get your food, guess what happens to you? Uh, you die. So then that cancer, this becomes stage two when it starts invading other tissues. But then it will stop when it can no longer get enough food. So it'll be small, stage one, and once it can trick the cells around it, it'll get a little bit bigger, it'll have a little growth spurt, and then it'll kind of hang out for a bit. At this point, it can no longer ask for help from its surrounding tissues. It has to ask the body for help. It has to say, I need my own food. I don't want to borrow it anymore. It will continuously send signals out. Your body will avoid it as long as possible. But then, lo and behold, if this is a malignant type of cancer, it will trick your body into growing it its own blood vessel. We call this angiogenesis. If that tumor can trick you into getting your own blood vessel, its own blood vessel, as soon as this blood vessel is complete, what does this tumor have its own access to? Blood and oxygen. And that tumor grows out of control. That's stage three when it officially gets its own blood vessel. Stage four is when accidentally one of these cells, and it just takes one, breaks off into that blood vessel, and it lands somewhere else in your body, and starts a whole new tumor. At that point, we say that it's metastasized. Okay? If it can get its own blood vessel, that cancer is pretty aggressive. So... Metastasizing is when it spreads. What types of risk factors are there for skin cancer? Sun exposure. Okay. Um, mostly sun exposure for skin cancer. We see that the, the highest prevalence of skin cancer is in truck drivers in their left arm because when they're driving, their arm is up against that window. A lot of times they just develop. And we see it. That, that's the highest prevalence of skin cancer. That and uh, the faces of, I forget what that is. The left side of the face for somebody. Anyways, that's where we see it the most. Three, three types that of skin cancer. There are far more types of skin cancer. But three basic types. Basal cell carcinoma. Guess where this is? The basal layer. Okay, just making that connection. Squamous cell. Squamous cell. It could be any of those skin cells. Because remember, our epithelial cells are simple squamous on our epidermis. Stratified squamous, I apologize for saying simple. I did say that wrong. And then melanoma, guess where this is? The melanocytes, the ones that produce our pigment, okay, which is why they show up in this darker color. So basal cell carcinoma is the one that we're like, okay, if we know it's there, we can cut it out. If I know that this is the cancer right here, do I just cut out the cancer? No, if you've been around anyone who has skin cancer, it kind of looks like a shark bite. That's kind of what they call it. They take pretty much all of this. So you're all going. And why do they do that? Yeah, just in case that she may have talked you into becoming cancerous, that I doesn't come up again. So whenever you have that area that has cancer, they're going to cut out around it. So it's going to be kind of a sharp bite looking thing. Okay? So it's easily cured. We can cut it out and be fine if we diagnose it early on. Okay, here's an example. Basal cell carcinoma, you can see where that is beneath the eye. Here is on the head. This is squamous cell, so there's a little bit of pigment there. And here's melanoma. Okay, you can see that pigment there. Um, that starts off with somebody thinking it's like a mole, and it continues to grow. Again, with tumors and all of that, if it continues to grow, it's because it's uncontrolled mitosis. That's a pretty good indication it's cancer. Squamous cell carcinoma, um, this involves obviously your epithelial cells and your epidermis, but you start to see this scaly, reddened papule, and it's on your scalp, on your, on your head, usually is where most people get it, and that was where that picture was there. It does metastasize, um, but if you know, if you, a lot of times people feel it in their head. They're like, I feel like this thing is here, and they get it checked out, and they realize that it's skin cancer. You get it cut out, and you're fine. Um, not normally do things grow on people's heads and then not know. I don't mean to say that in like yeah. a derogatory way, but usually people take notice to it, and if it's on their head, um, because they're so, I mean, they're aware of their head. Okay, melanoma is the cancer of the melanocytes, and you guys had already said that. 
This um, is a very metastatic cancer. As soon as it starts showing up, you should probably go to a doctor and say, hey, I just need you to check this out, and they'll do a biopsy on it real quick to make sure it is what it is. Anytime you're dealing with um, cancers, they use the ABCD rule to determine whether or not it's cancerous. If it's growing, like a mole typically grows pretty symmetrical. Like I realize the edges are a little off, but it's pretty, and then it kind of stops. It doesn't have this asymmetry to it where you're not really sure where the edge is and that edge continues to move around. That's an indication that that might not be supposed to be there. A border irregularity, so I mentioned that, that the edges are kind of messed up. The color, if there's a lot of different colors in it, it's probably not supposed to be there. If you see like some red, some browns, maybe some black, that probably shouldn't be there. Diameter, if it gets to be bigger than the end of a pencil eraser, you should probably get it checked out. That means it, it's obviously brought your attention. You've obviously noticed it, and you've been watching it. And if you've watched it grow, you should probably watch it get checked out too. Okay? Burns. So that was cancers. Now we have burns. <coughs> so you can get burned from a lot of things. Chemical burns, electricity burns, fire burns, um, sunburns. All of those are, all can cause burns. The problem with burning is that it damages <coughs> the skin, and it usually separates it from the dermis depending on how bad that burn is. The immediate threat with any burn, whether it's a sunburn or an electrical burn, is that you're going to dehydrate. Okay? So all the time we're try trying to pump full fluids, um, electrolytes, putting them on some saline, trying to keep them hydrated and keep their electrolyte levels well and balanced, homeostatic. If that individual becomes dehydrated, it can lead to kidney failure and then ultimately that individual will expire. How do you evaluate burns? We call it the rule of nines. And I'll show you, like whenever they say, oh, about 20% of their body was burned, this is how they calculate that. This diagram right here. The front of your leg is considered 9%. The back of your leg is also considered 9%. So if they say they've got about 20% of their body is covered in burns, that's the equivalent of one leg. Okay, how they calculate it. So you have that there. Then you, your perineum is 1%. Your trunk anterior is 18 posterior is 18 <coughs> The limbs, the front limbs, or the upper limbs, not front limbs, the front is 4.5%, back is 4.5%, so your whole arm would be 9% burned. Your face, the front is 4.5%, the back is 4.5%, and this is how they estimate it. Okay, so when they say they were burned over 25% of their body, these are the numbers that they use. It's the rule of nines when you estimate. So, um, difference between first degree, second degree, third degree burn is how deep and how much tissue is damaged. A first degree burn is usually, um, there's gonna be some swelling, it's gonna be uncomfortable. Uh, it could be, you know, you got sunburned, uh, just a basic sunburn. It could be that you touch something really quickly and it's gonna blister, or you ate a soup or drank a coffee that was really hot and it burned your lip. That could all be first degree burns. They heal after a couple days. They're uncomfortable, but you're not gonna be, it's just the, the, the superficial layer of your skin that's damaged, so it'll replace itself. Second degree burns, burn through the epidermis and into the dermis. The papillary layer of the dermis, there will be blisters if it's second degree, okay? Second degree burns will um, initiate blisters and it will separate the epidermis from the dermis. Third degree burns burn through the epidermis and the full dermis and you can usually see adipose and muscle in this. Whenever we have anyone who's severely burned, they ha do not have the ability to maintain homeostatic body temperatures. So I don't know how many of you have ever been in a burn unit. When you go to a burn unit, that burn unit is warm. Like it's a solid 85 to 90 degrees in there because that room has to be the temperature balance for that patient or those patients, okay? And um, whenever there's a third degree burn, there's, they don't feel pain anymore because they've burned through all the nerves. So once it's third degree, first and second are pretty painful, but third degree burn, you burn through the nerves and they don't really feel it anymore. Here, um, this is the type of thing that, you know, you're at a doctor's office or you work at a hospital and you have a kid who comes in and their hands burn. If you were the work in triage here, what would you probably say happened here? 
Yeah, he probably touched something hot. He might have touched the stove or he might have grabbed something. But whatever he did, he barely touched it with his fingers, but his palm got. So you listen to the explanations. Of course, and those of you who already work in this field, you're listening to their stories, gathering data, because you're observing at the same time you're listening to that story to make sure that there's not any foul play occurring. Of course, especially when children are involved. Okay, um, third degree burn here, that's pretty rough. Uh, you can clearly see that it's burned through the dermis. Um, you can see muscle, you can see adipose there. Okay, you can already see uh, damaged tissue slash there's like infection and pus here. And um, whenever you have a patient who ha that you're going to have to clean all of that, I mean, well, you don't have to if you're not in that, that field, but if you are, then you will. Okay. Um, how do we know if a burn is critical? If 25, over 25% of their body has second degree burns, that's considered critical because it's hard for them to maintain homeostasis. And again, it's, they're wor worried about them becoming dehydrated, their electrolyte levels dropping. If greater than 10% of their body has third degree burns. That's considered critical. If your face, hands, or feet have third degree burns, you're considered critical. Why face, hands, or feet? More what? Nerves. Nerves? Well, you don't feel them anymore. Temperature That's temperature regulation. I don't know how many of you, um, especially girls, when you're hot, the very first thing you do is pull your hair up in a ponytail because we can release heat from here. When you're in bed at night and you get hot, tell me what you do to cool off. Put one foot out. And then when you get cold, what do you do? Pull that foot back in. Your foot is your thermostat, and that's a quick way for you to release heat and regulate your body temperature. So your head and feet are super important for maintaining homeostasis as far as temperature is concerned. And now tonight, whenever you're asleep and you kick your foot out, you're going to be like, I see what I'm doing there. Okay, oops, I didn't talk about how to fix them. How do we treat bri uh, brides? How do we treat burns? We debride them, which means we take off all the burned tissue. We get rid of everything that's damaged. Okay, and we want to treat with antibiotics because they're susceptible to infection because there's no protective barrier. We put a temporary covering like a bandage, but we also know that it's going to weep. So it's going to pus, it's, going to, it's still going to create fluids. We need to make sure to keep that clean. And then eventually we'll do skin grafts, depending on the, the severity of that burn. It could be a series of skin grafts, or it may just be one. Um, when you're a baby, your skin <laughs> grows from your ectoderm. You have three layers, because we learned that in biology, not necessarily you know that. That's where that's coming from. Um, babies, while they're growing, had this lingual quote, coat, where they have this um, soft, waxy hair as they're growing in utero. Um, some of them, especially when they're born, still have that waxy type hair, and it falls off within the first couple weeks, um, sometimes first week or so. The infancy to adulthood, your skin becomes thicker, you accumulate more fat, and what happens with age? Your skin gets thicker still, the older you get? It gets thinner. So as you go from being a kid to an adult, it gets thicker, it's healthier as you're going through the main parts of your years. And then as you begin to age, your epidermis becomes thinner, which leads to um, easy tears and slow healing. And so you'll see a lot of wound care nurses working with geriatric patients or older patients because those wounds that would normally take someone like us seven or eight days to heal may take them six to eight weeks to heal because the skin is so thin. And we see wrinkling, hair thinning with age. What do you do to delay the aging of your skin. You take a shower, you drink water, you take a multivitamin every day, and you get some type of physical activity. <coughs> it will make you live forever, at least healthily forever. I can't help you if a car runs you over or something like that. I'm not trying to say that, okay? But like your body, UV protection, take care of yourself, eat well, lots of fluids, take showers, okay? Now take a break. Oh, I need to hit stop.